Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor, adventures of a lifetime. From the Apostrophe Podcast Network. Hello, everybody. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. Mike Klink will likely never be able to escape, and nor may he want to for that matter, the fact that he produced the first five albums for Guns N' Roses. As a producer, he's worked with Metallica and Megadeth, Beth Hart, and most importantly, me. As an engineer, he's worked with a multitude of who's who in the music business, including Joe Walsh, Eddie Money, Frank Zappa, Hart, and Paul Anka. His sound as a producer is admittedly big, and even though he can do bombastic, he can also do subtle. Remember that opening lush vocal arrangement of Paradise City? You know it. Take me down to the Paradise City where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. The blending of the vocals of Izzy and Duff was one of his production moments of genius. I truly didn't know any of this when I met him. You know when you have one of those times in life where someone who is already a good friend introduces you to someone else, and you kind of become an even closer friend to this new person. Well, a talented and successful engineer named Noel Golden, whom I had known since high school, and who went on to work with the likes of Edwin, Chantal Kravyacic, and Guns N' Roses, had reconnected with me to work on my new album called Mother Earth. Yet to still be officially released, by the way. After working on several of the songs, Noel thought the album project would benefit from having a name producer to up the ante both sonically and in terms of exposure. The album carries with it a message of environmental concern, and he had a hunch that maybe, just maybe, Mike Klink would be interested. At the risk of making this all about me, you have to understand that as an artist, as insecure as I am, I still have my agenda. And even if you told me Sir George Martin himself had come back from beyond the grave to produce my music, I'd still be thinking, yeah, okay, but does he get me? And will he be the best for my music? Never mind someone I had never heard of, simply because I spent the 80s and 90s in a canoe in the northern woods of Canada and was just not a big fan of Guns N' Roses at the time. But Mike got involved, as he told me, for about two or three reasons. First, he thought the music was good, and that was important. He liked it. Second, he thought the message was strong, and he wanted to get behind it. And third, I guess after meeting me, he figured he could stand working with this survival TV celebrity wannabe rock star on a few songs. Mike has produced my three latest albums, two of which will be released in 2021. He told me once that only two times in his career did he hear an artist and think, this is going to be huge, before anyone else thought so. The first was Eddie Money, and the second was Guns N' Roses. I like to remind him that the third was me. And he would reply, yeah, yeah, of course, Les. To set the stage, Mike and I sat in his backyard in Woodland Hills, California, on a hilltop, on a characteristically hot Southern California day, so you'll hear the sounds of L.A. in the background. This time around, it just felt appropriate to include our moments at the mic just before beginning to talk. These are the words of Mike Klink. That's the beauty of making music. There is no right or wrong. That was it for me. It was the Beatles and nothing else. I mean, uh, obviously there were there were other things going on, and I listened to the radio on a daily basis every day. But the Beatles drove my world musically. So I walk on sand.
you know what's awesome is I'm now giving my clink microphone instructions. Yeah. And this is like, this, I'm really on top of it here. This is, this. Yeah, well, what's you, your sexy voice? There's nothing sexy about my nasally voice. Uh, I don't know, Mike. <clears throat> Sounding pretty good right now. Let me see. It's <laughs> la, 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 la. Okay, just are you is that gonna be your talking voice? You wanna hear my talking voice? This is my talking voice. Doesn't get any better than this. Hold this it. is about this is about as good as it gets, Les. Then, then then don't go any farther away from the microphone than that. You're not on the mic. No, you've been on the mic a million times. Yeah, I used to sing on the mic, but very sensitive tube microphones. Ah, is it? This is a not an SM7. It's an SM8. You said SM7. Yeah, it's an SM7, 7B. B are the newer ones. Yeah, I love, I love the SM7s. This is what I uh, used to record vocals with. But you yeah. got to be a really hard singer, because these are not very sensitive microphones. You've got to really push to get them to sound great. Really? Yep. Vo for vocals, yeah. I'm surprised they're using this for uh podcast. Oh, it's the number one. Oh, come on, stop. This thing is going to bug me. Are you... Uh, you it's the number one microphone for podcasts. I did not know that. It is. I uh, would have never guessed that in a million years, seriously. Yeah, for radio and talking. No, I thought an RE20. RE20. Well, some prefer that, but this, this is the one, I mean, because like I'm right up on it and you just have a nice vocal tone like the tone is always nice on people's voices like i, I uh, yeah. did bruce coburn before you i can't hear what i sound like i know you don't have the headphones on i'm not gonna yeah. give you headphones because really, you know most people get headphones that's no. when we did our podcast together we had headphones only cool people well they had a huge budget that was serious radio remember that this is serious radio microphone right here <laughs> you close enough it's pretty bright out here. <laughs> you have sunglasses. Yeah, we'll put yours on. Mine are in the car. Mm, I'm sorry. That's okay. I just close my eyes and pretend I'm in Tahiti. There we go. Okay, Les, I'm <sighs> seriously. Right, I'm not. Start. I'm not good at this. So we'll see. We'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, it's then not we'll... going to work. But that's okay. I don't expect it to work. But I need to practice for other people. Okay, good. When I have real people on here. Yeah. Like Tony Bronigal. Are you doing Tony? I'm doing Tony later today. So you know what the difficulty of this is? It's the same problem I had with when I um, we're recording now. When I when I interviewed Doug Adams, it was like okay, well, well we're buddies. So what the, what the hell do you want to talk about? It's it's always like tricky. But the reality is that that actually through the past couple of years of hanging with you and knowing you, you've actually dropped little things here and there all along the way that always go ah. Oh, I had to remember to get back to him on that. So like, for example, yesterday or two days ago, you, said, you started talking about something I'd never heard you talk about before, which is a great place to start. I had no idea that your childhood and your dad and that had an element of nature to it. Just let's go right back to that. Where, where did you come out of? The story that we were talking about is the, when I grew up in Maryland on the Chop Tank River, and it was a small fisher town. It was a small town of oyster farmers. And the fact that the whole industry of that town was driven by uh, oyster farming, which pretty much doesn't exist in that town anymore. I think maybe tourism uh, drives the economy now. But growing up there, we would see the oyster boats set sail out to the bay. And these were all sailboats. These were old school wooden ships that would go out and they would bring in tons and tons of oysters that we would enjoy some of the uh, freshest oysters in the world caught uh, that day or, or harvested that day, brought in to the uh, shore. And then we would uh, enjoy shucked oysters in the evening and you could buy them at the corner grocery store, where there, in that town, there were no big chain supermarkets. They were all little mom and pop ventures there. Well, not even at that time. Uh, there wouldn't have been big chain box stores. Wait, get, what year is this? This would have been in the uh, mid 60s. And you'd be 64, how, how, 65. How old? A you uh, youngster. I would have been probably 12 years old around that time. Mid 60s. So it's B 
Beatles. Musically speaking, it's oh, yeah. Beatles. It's absolutely Chuck Beatles. Berry still and Elvis still, and to some respect, Be- it was Beatles. Really, that was it. That was it for me. It was the Beatles and nothing else. I mean, uh, obviously there were other things going on, and I listened to the radio on a daily basis every day. But the Beatles drove my world musically. I wanted to ask you, why is the Beatles on in your car right now? Like, why? Why? Not, you know, is it just? Oh, I'm just enjoying these old tracks. Or as a producer, I'm asking you, why is the Beatles on in your car right now? Why is the Beatles channel on? You know, the Beatles songs, I just love the depth. And the beauty of the Beatles, you would think that you get tired of listening to those songs over and over, but you really don't. Every song from the era, even though they only recorded in such a short span, the volume of work that they did was incredible and every record was different. I mean, there, you know, you could kind of tell the stuff that was done in the sixties and then they went, started to go through the psychedelic era, but I enjoy listening to those records. And now that I think about it, maybe even on a sentimental level, maybe subconsciously it takes me back to a, a time when, you know, I didn't have any worries in the world back in the 60s and I was just enjoying music for music's sake as opposed to listening to music now. I listen to it differently probably than most people listen to the music. You know, I kind of, even if I hear a song, I start tearing it apart. I start listening to the beat. I start listening to the lyrics. I listen to, does it have a, a signature lick in there? You know, what's the hi-hat doing? What's the kick drum pattern? So, back, are, you, are you jaded? No, I don't think I'm jaded at all. I just don't listen to music as a listener as much for enjoyment. I'm analyzing the music. I'm trying to understand why they did what and why they put that kick pattern in. Or, And if I hear something that's a little off-putting to me, then I'll I, I kind of make a mental note. I would have done that differently. But that's the thing about production as well, starting to get away from the Beatles, is that you learn what you like and what you don't like. And obviously, the beauty of production is that everybody would do it differently. A hundred people will d- do it a hundred different ways. And there's no right or wrong. That's the beauty of making music. There is no right or wrong. I can't watch television without doing the very same thing. I analyze the crap out of television. I, like, I come out cynical and critical. Like, do you find yourself going, oh, God, that's horrible crap? Or inspired, I mean, or you probably get both, I'm sure. Uh, it's, but. A, it's a little bit of both. I mean, uh, you know, I don't think I, I'm jaded. I, I just, you have to appreciate... Uh, popular music, which is if you turn on the radio and you're listening to to FM radio, uh, terrestrial radio, that's what uh, constitutes uh, popular music. There's some I like, some I don't, but you know, I don't really take issue with things that, that I don't like. I mean, I think I realize in general that music today is more disposable than it was in my day or, you know, when I was growing up listening to music. However, that's my perspective. My kids' perspective is totally different. This is the music that they will, you know, when they're in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s, they'll go, oh my God, I just love Taylor Swift. I remember that song. I was in high school or junior high and I was, you know, doing this, going to this prom or, or, you know, hanging out with these friends. And that becomes music that's important to them. So I think that music means something to each generation. And I think you're most susceptible and uh, affected by music when you're in your, your teens and your twenties and going through life experiences. I mean, as you get older, you kind of just kind of get on an even keel, you know, you have your work, your job, and you're doing this and that. And music in my world is my primary interest. But, you know, for most people, it becomes secondary. It becomes entertainment to them. Music is not entertainment to me. uh, Music is uh, my profession and what I do. Go from shucking oysters to when did you first feel, when did you first feel the music? The first time I felt the music, I was uh, living in Washington, D.C. And uh, we lived in uh, some townhouse, And there was a, it was a big complex and there was a communal trash area. And it was interesting. That's where everybody threw their trash. 
And what, what year and, is this now? Well, this is even before I moved to the Eastern Shore for the oysters. So I was even younger than uh, 11 or 12 years old. I don't know. I was probably maybe nine or 10 years old at that point, maybe even younger. And you know, one of the things that you did, you kind of went into that trash bin and you looked and found things. And one of the things that I found was an old radio and it was a, a what they call a FADA radio, F-A-D-A. It was one of those plastic radios that now is worth thousands of dollars. Someone had thrown it away and I got in there and it worked perfectly. A couple of the little bits had fallen off, but they were all hanging around in the same area. So I gathered all the parts, I glued them on and I just became fascinated with the radio. I took that old radio that someone had thrown in the trash and every night would uh, take that radio you had to plug it in and I would take it under the covers with me so that my parents wouldn't know that I was still awake and just listen to the music and I was just fascinated by by, uh, the song so I was listening really as a listener I didn't have any thoughts that I would go into the music business at that point um I wasn't really playing any instruments. I was just, you know, listening. I was more into sports at that point. Sports? What kind of sports? Uh, Baseball. Baseball was my sport. I loved playing baseball. I loved playing first base because you were involved in every play. I hated to be in the outfield where you just stood there waiting for something to happen. So when you played first base, you were involved in almost every play of the game. Were you any good at all ever? Um, I was good, but uh, did, but like, did you have the American boy dream of of sights on the? Oh, I think pro everybody league? does. I mean, you're Canadian, didn't you think that you were going to be a, a hockey professional player. hockey, <laughs> of course hockey I player did. at one point? Oh, I had my spot on the Toronto Maple Leafs bench ready. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I I had my heroes. You know, the the. Uh, Mickey Mantles and Roger Maris's and Boog Powell's of the of the world. And I loved baseball. I loved living and breathing it. But it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now, just like everything. I mean, you can turn on the radio or, or turn on the TV and, and uh, watch almost any team that plays anywhere in the United States. You have to remember back in those days, you were st- limited by whoever was within that broadcast area. So I lived in Washington, D.C. at that time, and it was the Washington Senators, which had a baseball team and a football team. Neither of them exist to this day. You know, they became franchises that moved on to other cities. So, for example, I mean, I moved to California in 19, uh, jumping ahead in 1975, and I was living in, uh, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois at that time. And I was a huge Cubs fan. You were either National League Cubs or uh, Cardinals, or if you were American League, you were a, a White Sox fan. And I was a huge Cubs fan, and I used to listen to them on the radio, which I would get, and they only broadcast during the day in the summer, so I had a little portable radio, battery-powered, that I would carry on my around my belt and listen to the radio, listen to the games with Harry Carey and the broadcasters out of Chicago. But when I moved to Los Angeles, I couldn't get the the games. There was no such thing as satellite radio and and uh, they weren't broadcasting all the games on uh, TV like they are now. So I became a, uh, a Dodgers fan through default. Still like the Cubs, <laughs> still follow the Cubs every year, but uh, I had to become a Dodgers fan because there was no way that I could really follow the, uh, the team once I had moved the Cubs. With all those names you just dropped, are there like, Tons of people listening to this right now groaning because of your allegiances. Baseball. Uh, I don't think so. I think you know. I don't think any. There's there's a few rivalries, but um, I I think if if you're a sports fan, people support the, the sports. You know, they may disagree with you, but you know the rivalries are in the most part friendly. I think it starts to get a little. uh a little testy when you start talking about football and even hockey, you know, those those rivalries. If you're sitting in the stands as a Raiders fan in a game against the Raiders, you 
better watch what you say and watch the uniforms that you wear. And uh, it's, it's uh, as I said, baseball rivalries typically are much friendlier. They're not soccer fans is what you're saying for sure. Oh yeah, they're not, people are not, you know, there's always the instance, the exception to the rule, but I think overall baseball fans, it's a much uh, friendlier uh, sport. I mean, football is uh, a gladiator sport. It's all about yeah. blood. And then when you talk so about hockey, ho- when you talk about hockey, the joke is, I was I was at a hockey game and or a, I, was, I went to the fights and a hockey yeah, game broke out. Yeah, yeah exactly. I know. And when you were young, then was your world uh, very black and white split between like the things that affected you as a kid? So you're you're nine to fourteen years old ish, and uh, was it baseball? And music, or what else? What else uh, came into your psyche? Reading, I love to read. I mean, I was uh, a voracious reader. I would read absolutely everything. I mean, I would get. We had a when I lived in Washington D.C. We had a bookmobile that used to come around, and I would just, uh, I could actually finish a couple books before the bookmobile even left. I mean, I just, I used to make lists of all the books that I had read, and I remember taking it to my. Uh, my teacher one year and, and uh, she's like, oh my God, I can't believe how many books you read. And I still uh, enjoy reading. I'm mostly nonfiction. I really enjoy learning. And uh, so it was sports uh, and it was uh, listening to music. I wasn't playing music back in those days yet and reading. Those were my, those were my pastimes. When did the music start then? Uh, technically speaking, what was the first instrument? When did you even think I should pick up a guitar or sit at the piano? What happened? To have this all make sense, I'll, I'll tell you, I was born outside of uh, Baltimore in a town called Hagerstown, lived in Hagerstown. Then we moved to Washington, D.C. Then we moved back to Hagerstown. And then I moved to Cambridge, the eastern shore of Maryland, and then uh, moved to Illinois. So it was on that second move back to Hagerstown, I started playing uh, the violin. I really wanted to play the violin. I just was Why? Infatu- why, why the violin? I was infatuated with the violin. I had a an album called Rusty and Orchestraville. It was put out on Capitol Records. And I was just, I just loved the sound of the violin. It was something that could be played as a solo instrument. And my mom was more of a classical, someone to listen to classical music. So it was something that she embraced and uh, said, oh, you know, we'll get you a violin. We'll give you lessons. But it got to the point, the lessons were always on Saturday. And my teacher was not uh, warm and fuzzy. And it was in the middle of the afternoon. And I used to look out the window and I would see all my friends playing baseball. And I tried and I tried to love the violin, but I had I couldn't concentrate when I saw all of my friends outside having a great time. So I gave up the violin. However, when I moved to Cambridge, Maryland, the very first uh, day orientation, they had a music teacher. And to be a music teacher, you have to be able to play every instrument. So we are all the the uh, all the students are sitting in the auditorium. This guy gets up and does his presentation. He plays every instrument. He plays them all. And the instrument that I loved was the uh, the trumpet. I mean, I just fell in love with the trumpet. Once again, it's an instrument that could play solo. I started learning it in school and uh, it stuck with me. I became very good. I became first chair, first trumpet in the orchestra and played trumpet for years and years and years. And I was also uh, in the marching band. I was in I was in the high school marching band when I was in junior high because they I was good. However, it wasn't my favorite thing to do because I had to dress up with uh, a big hat with a plume in it and spats. And I wasn't able to sit in the stands with all my friends and watch the football game. I had to be with the band, which is cool. I had friends in the band as well, but I didn't have the freedom to walk around and and do what I wanted. So I I played for years and years until I moved to, actually until I moved to uh, California. Listeners of this podcast know that I don't usually introduce the songs I play. What you might not know is that 98% of the time, they are my songs, simply because It would be way too expensive, especially in this case, to play Guns N' Roses. 
I'm pretty sure you can find them anywhere anyway. But this time around, it's all in keeping with the situation to play a track or two of mine because Mike is producing them. This first song is meant to be the lead-out single, if you will, for my new album called Mother Earth. It features Slash playing the solo guitar, who Mike obviously brought into the situation because Slash also has a deep love for wildlife and conservation, and the proceeds will go to his favorite charity. This is my song, One Giant Farm, featuring Slash.
You're surviving life with Les Stroud. I have a feeling that if I say, when did you decide to do music professionally, you didn't have, would I be right in thinking you didn't have an epiphany, but you kept building upon yourself and at some point started directing towards this career? Like, where, um, or, or was there an epiphany where you thought, you know was, what? Shit, I'm good at this. I'm going to. No, there um, was an epiphany. Okay. There was, I mean, it wasn't, wrong but it wasn't one single day, but it was in junior high when I was playing in the bands, playing uh, in the orchestras. I started buying records. I mean, at that point, I was starting to buy albums like The Doors and The Allman Brothers and The Beatles and The Box Tops. I would take those records and I would listen to them down in my room with headphones on and I would dissect them. And at that point, I realized that I wanted to make records. I was fascinated with the sound of records the bal- I would listen to the balances, the instrumentation, how everything worked, and I studied those like I would study a textbook. The albums that I had, I, I knew all the musicians, I knew the producers, I knew some of the engineers, but mostly I followed the producer's career and even go to a record store. And if there was a producer that I really liked, such as Peter Asher, I would buy everything that he that he put out. So living in Illinois, going to high school, and even in junior high, I knew I wanted to make records. In fact, I subscribed to Billboard magazine when I was in high school. I'm trying to understand why, in a cliche sense, you wouldn't have wanted to have been a, a rock star rather than a producer. Why? Why? It sounds a little geeky that you focused in on producers. That's an unheard story. Well, at that time, um, I wasn't playing guitar. Because you can sing, right? You, you, I can sing. I was, I was, yes, that's another thing. I was in the choir all the time through uh, high school and junior high. So, I was, so why didn't you want to be Paul McCartney or Neil Young or whomever? Probably because I was a little bit shy. Okay. And I didn't want to stand out, so to speak. You know, I didn't mind, you know, first chair, first trumpet. You're still sitting with, you know, 40, 50 other people. And I'm not, even though I may have taken a solo, it wasn't as if... I was the sole focus of a performance. So maybe it was because I was a little bit shy, but I mean, I really, it was my wheelhouse. I mean, I really felt there was just something that drew me to understanding how records were made. And people have always asked me, do you wish you were playing in front of 20,000 people? I go, no. I always wanted to be the the person behind the the scenes. I always wanted to be that guy who made someone else famous. When I wanted to be a filmmaker, I would sit there with a stopwatch watching a documentary that I liked and I would time a clip of a sunset or something. And I'd say, look at this director. He let that clip go for 32 seconds. Nobody's doing, oh, and I would make a note of that. And it would come to fruition later in my own work. I would argue with the network about a shot, usually of me, a survivor man, doing something. And I would, and I said, no, let it breathe, let it breathe, let it breathe, let it, and now. Where they wanted to chop it 12 seconds earlier. But that came from dissecting films long before I made them. So who were these producers? I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to say Tom Dowd. Who, who, who else was in that ilk at that time? Well, I mean, Tom Dowd, from the work he did with the Allman Brothers, that live record was one of my absolute favorite records. I mean, I, I love that. I loved, obviously, I think George Martin was, had the biggest influence on me because of the depth of those records. And even during that time when Sgt. Pepper's, I understood the limited amount of technology because I had done some research and, and I understood how records were made. And I thought, here's a guy who can take eight tracks and continually bounce down and make a record of such depth as Sergeant Peppers with everything that's going on. And he committed. I mean, you had to commit when you bounced down, you had to commit to the balances that you had and the effects that you had in there. That is absolutely incredible. And I think most people don't understand how difficult that was to make a record like Sgt. Pepper's with that amount of technology. Of course, they they were breaking the barriers. They were doing things that no one else had done. That was 
why people who heard those records went, oh my God, I can't believe what I just heard because no one else had ever done it. And uh, kudos to uh, Jeff Emmerich, who was his uh, engineer to get those sounds. I mean, that together, along with the talent of the Beatles and their vision as well, created some uh, sonic landscapes that had never been heard before. Do you think it would behoove a modern day young independent artist to get himself an old Fostex X15 from a pawn shop to try recording that way where you're forced into four tracks or eight tracks and bouncing down? Or no, that's just silly. Go to Pro Tools and, and have at her. Yeah, I mean, I think that the ship has sailed as far okay. as... That's so old school as it old was school, what it was. I mean, yeah. the technology is here. I believe that you might as well take advantage of it. However, you should put limits on that technology. I mean, the problem it now is... Not the fact that you only have eight tracks when you did a Fostex or, you know, 16 tracks, whatever. It's the the fact that you rely so heavily on the technology as opposed to the, um, the talent. The talent. People lead with the technology versus uh, leading with the, the talent and let the technology supplement what's happening in the studio. Is that a problem for you? I mean, I can speak from experience in working with you and the way you work on me in vocals, and I'm not a good singer, but you are meticulous and you are tiring to me uh, because I don't have that strength or that talent. No, I, no I, I, I use technology to my benefit and to the artist's benefit, meaning but is it a your crutch? benefit. But is it a crutch? It's absolutely not a crutch. You not know? to you, but how about, I think what you're getting at is someone new today. Are you suggesting that, yeah, like some, the people are, will use it as a crutch when they should work the craft? The, the technological part of how I make a record is the last thing that filters in to how my records are made. I don't automatically throw auto-tune on any vocalist. I try to get a great performance. I try to get it as in pitch as possible so it sounds as natural as possible. I'm hoping to only use technology to breathe on the actual song as opposed to have it so integral in the song that the song doesn't make sense without the technology. In other words, if you deconstructed the song, it wouldn't make any sense. On the records that I make, you could take all the technology away and it would still make sense. It would sound different, but it wouldn't be night and day. You wouldn't go, oh my God, I can't believe that's what it sounded like before you did this or that. However, I use technology if I need to make a loop or if I need to filter something. All that stuff makes it easier. If I need to breathe on a vocal and kind of tune it a little bit, I'll do that. But I really want the artist to shine as an artist. And part of that is having them work hard. I mean, that's what you do as an artist. If that's your career, you, got, you have to work hard. It's not easy. Once again, I'll introduce the next song simply because it has a bit of a story to it. I had actually completed it in full with Noel Golden, and I thought it was beautiful. So did Mike. But he liked it so much that he asked if he could start from scratch and produce it the way he thinks it should sound. This is how I discovered Mike's sense of subtlety in music. He brought in keyboard player Jamie Mahoborek to replace my own piano playing and the legendary Tim Pierce to play guitar. This is, apparently, Mike's favorite song from my album Mother Earth, co-written with my friend Brian Potvin, from the Canadian rock band, The Northern Pikes. This is When It's Gone.
won't be without pain When all our big plans have fallen through So I'll walk on sand And I'll walk on frozen lands I'll walk in forests where I Your surviving life with Les Stroud. What was your first job actually in the industry where you thought, okay, I got this. I'm somebody. Uh, Not so much you somebody, but what's the fir- what was the first move? Well, the first, well. Um, Do you remember? First thing yeah, you did. The very first thing I did. Well, back in Illinois, I used to hang out in a uh, an agency, a booking agency. I was pretty much a fly in the wall and I would hang out and there was a band that I had met and we were, they needed a sound man and uh, I did live sound. It only lasted for one day. Did you fumble around at first on the, oh, on the soundboard? I, and The whole thing was a fumble. Yeah, The whole thing was a fumble. It was a fail. It was a <laughs> miserable fail. In fact, I only mixed live sound one time and that was it. I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. I gave him the keys back to the van and said, see you later. I'm done. This is it. Why? Yeah. What, what? I just hated the, I hated the experience. I didn't have control over, it was so different than, than, uh, and I had never made a record at that point, but it was different. I, I couldn't make it sound like the record. I was dealing with feedback through the monitors. I was trying everything to get the vocals to come over the band because they were a rock band. I just hated the experience. I didn't, I was not in control. I think I'm a, 
I'm a bit of a control freak. So I was totally out of my element. I didn't have control of the situation and I felt uncomfortable and did not enjoy the experience. Had I enjoyed the experience, I might be mixing live sound to this day. Maybe. I don't know. Well, how did you rebound from that? What was what was next? What what actually launched you oh, into? Oh, it was years later. I mm-hmm. mean, that was I like a one-off. That was be it. It, was a, it was a one-off. It was years later. So, you know, I was still friendly with a lot of different bands and hanging out with the bands, but I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't managing them. I was just friends with the band and I was just seeing how it worked. I was doing research and reading, you know, reading Billboard. I subscribed to Billboard. At that point, I subscribed to Cashbox. And had, you, had you moved out of the home yet? No, I'm still, well, I mean, I'm in college and I hadn't moved away from Illinois. No, I was living in a dorm. You know, I still wasn't involved in the music business. It wasn't until I moved to California that I got a job at the record plant. You were asking me what my, this was my first legitimate job was answering phones at the record plant. Answering the phones meant that you were security and doorman and concierge to all the artists that walked in the door because we served the artists first and foremost. And then as well as the the staff at the studio. And that's how everybody started. You either answered the phones or you were a janitor. I wanted to be in the studio. So I enjoyed answering the phones. It wasn't a glamorous job, neither as being a runner or a, a janitor, but I was there and I wasn't outside of the studio doing errands for people. I was there in the studio. So I got to deal and say hello to the artist as they came in. And I was involved in the office management part of it. Was there influence that you can look back upon that came from your mom or your dad? I know you lost your dad uh, young. Yep. He was young. Yep. Uh, was there musical musicality oh. in, in their families? Yeah, I mean, my my mom grew up uh, on a farm and they had a piano and they had an organ and they would sit around and they would play. So my mom played the piano and we had that same piano. I still have that same organ that I own that I took from uh, the farm after she passed away. And she was a great singer, but she would always sing harmonies when we would be in church I was always a little embarrassed because she was always singing the harmonies. And I thought, why are you doing the harmonies? Why aren't you singing the melody? But it got to the point where I could appreciate that and she could read music. And I got to the point where I could read music from, uh, you know, playing in the orchestra. So she was a big influence on me as far as the family goes. But she was the only one, my dad couldn't hold a note. At Christmas, I would always play a solo. Uh, trumpet, and then I would always uh, sing a solo song at Christmas, and I don't know how, but I guess I was the the entertainment for uh, for our little church, <laughs> which doesn't fit with your personality, no. as you said. Did, was your uh, forgive me for asking? Was your mom still around to see your career as it oh, started yeah. to blossom? Yeah. Oh yeah, and she did, she didn't understand it. I, I remember when uh, I went back home because I didn't go back a lot because I didn't have a, first of all, I was working 24 seven, it seemed almost. I was, I put in an average of about 80 hours a week, but finally after I had done my first record of note that she knew the artist, which was Paul Anka, I remember going back and explaining the whole process to her of how records were made, of how I set up the microphones and people would sing into it and they would go through the little wires. And after this 15 minute dissertation on how records are made, she goes, yeah, but did you ever meet Paul Anka? And that was her question to me. And uh, yes, you yeah. know, I was, he was right there. He was, he was definitely singing. So it sounds to me, I'll bet knowing your personality, sorry, I'm going to make an assumption here that, you were probably, there was a mix of, wow, I just met so-and-so, which is ultimately cool. And yeah, I just met another so-and-so and whatever. Who'd you rub shoulders with then? Well, everybody recorded at the record plant. It was the number one studio in the world. But the, I have to say, to this day, the only person that I ever got goosebumps and it was like the wow, it was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm seeing this person. I was a huge Stevie Wonder fan back in Illinois. So when I moved to California, uh, when I was working at the record plant, Studio B was built for Stevie Wonder. 
And I'll never forget, there was a long hallway that ran the length of the studio, was which was half a block long. When I was first working there, I was at one end of the uh, the hallway and coming at me, walking by himself with Stevie Wonder right at me. And it was just that moment going, oh my God, there's Stevie Wonder. First of all, walking by himself, mm-hmm. But you have to realize he lived in that studio and they built it for him. So he knew every inch of that place. So right in the middle of the the hallway was a lounge and the bathrooms. And we're both walking together. I make a right. He makes a left. He goes into the bathroom. I go into the bathroom. There's two urinals and there I am (laughs) right next to Stevie Wonder. And I'm like, it was like one of those, oh my God, is this really happening? Surreal. <laughs> it was a surreal moment. But I did rub elbows. I mean, all those people were around. I mean, Peter Frampton, Stephen Stills, the Eagles, so many different bands. Everybody was around. But as an employee of the studio, and especially in the position that I was in at that time, which was either answering the phones or as an coffee assistant, as a runner yeah, or so on, yeah. You know, answering the phones, an assistant engineer, helping out people. You knew your place in the studio. You know, there were boundaries. You know, you don't walk up to someone and go, hey, I really love that last record you did. What size strings did you use? And what kind of picks do you use? You know, that's they're there to create and... Chris Stone and Gary Kelgren ran a tight ship. There were rules. If you went outside of those boundaries, you were gone. And I saw many people come and go. If you couldn't uh, abide by the rules and be a team player in that sense, you were gone. I mean, there was a time and a place. There would be a time and a place as you climbed up the ladder you were able to ask more questions of the artist. You were able to interact with the artist. But at that point and at that level, when you first start, you're a a service to the studio and to the client. Did you have ideas early? As much as I would admire various filmmakers and I would sit there with my stopwatch, there were also moments where I'd go, I, I could have done that better. You know, or I, or I would have done it this way, maybe not better, but this way, my way. Did you start to get ideas of how you would be as a producer in those early days? Well, yeah. I mean, that's how you become a producer. I mean, at least in my experience, what you do, and I think this holds true for everyone. I mean, you learn by your mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, then you're not doing anything. You're not pushing the boundaries. So I learned, first of all, sitting behind some of the best producers and engineers in the world, I learned things that worked. I learned things that didn't work. I learned technical skills that they had, you know, and I learned how to do them myself. And I also learned people skills that I would see. There were some producers that were amazing, but didn't have great people skills. So, you know, I took the best of the best and I threw out the things that I didn't like. And that helped me to become the producer that I am today. So when I started working with artists, you know, as an engineer initially, and then a co-producer and then producer, I made a lot of mistakes, but I learned from those mistakes and gained confidence as I went along to the point where I turned down a lot of opportunities to produce some of the biggest bands in the world at that time. They had asked me to work with them and I turned them down and people thought I was crazy. But I didn't want to work with an artist if I felt that I couldn't help them and make them better or control the situation because I knew I would fail. I would be a failure if that was the situation. So I waited until I knew that I had all the skills that I needed to be able to relate to any artist that I uh, would become involved with. And I think that in today's world, too many people set themselves up for failure because they haven't had the experience and they look at it and go, oh my God, this is a great opportunity for me. It may on paper look like a great opportunity, but in actuality, it is a deep, dark, black hole that they set themselves up for failure for. And that's where I will leave part one of my interview with Mike Klink, shortly after standing at a urinal, rubbing shoulders, if you will, with Stevie Wonder. 
Make sure you listen for part two, where Mike will go into intense and deep detail of the private, never-before-heard stories and affairs of Slash and Axl Rose. Okay, never mind. No, he won't. We keep those private. Mike's mantra is now written on the wall of my home studio, a phrase he would often recite whenever we disagreed on something. He would adopt a relaxed pose, lean back in his chair, and say, Less. I'm not always right, but I'm never wrong. My engineer, Keith Ullman, now knows he has to make this podcast sound good enough for a legendary engineer in the music business to approve, because Keith, Mike's going to be listening. We are a member of the Apostrophe Podcast Network, which is secretly run by the Irish Mafia. Stick around, everyone. We'll figure this out. Oh, hang on. I just want to do a little shameless self-plugging here. A big reminder to find Survivor Man Dash Les Stroud on YouTube. That's my channel. You will find hundreds of new and archived video clips. Everything from many seasons of Survivor Man and Survivor Man Bigfoot to how-to video clips on outdoor skills to music videos. So find me on YouTube and enjoy the entertainment and edification for free. And this is important. Please subscribe so I can keep bringing you new content. While you're at it, if you're in North America, search out your local PBS station, even if you're in Canada, because they bleed up into there as well, and find out when they air my new series, Wild Harvest, all about local foraging and how to prepare those wonderful wild edibles. Thanks for listening, gang. Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor. Adventures of a Lifetime.